a publication uh, such as a journal article in a very simple term is defined as open access when we can freely access this over the net. Uh, there are many dimensions to open access, but uh, for now, let's just stick to this uh, simple understanding. But then why it is important? Because knowledge is public good, and we usually face barriers while trying to access scholarly knowledge. For example, journal articles, either we need a subscription through institution, or we have to buy the access of an individual article that we want to read. All are expensive. Subscription charges are quite high, uh, at, least, uh, at least for the countries in South Asia and so far in Africa or Latin America. But many of us actually completely dependent on SIHA for accessing papers. <laughs> Anyway, uh, coming back to this fundamental principle of open access, since most of the scholarly articles comes from publicly funded research, there is a general conviction that it should, be, should not be behind the payout of big commercial publishers. Since the formation of the idea of open access in around 2002, 2003, many changes happened in the scholarly publishing industry as an aftermath of this demand, of rise for, oh, demand for OA raise. Uh, at present, many articles are accessible from the website of publishers as they are published in open access journal, but generally the authors usually pay few thousand USD for their research to make it open access. There are other forms of access like authors deposit a version of their article in an open repository and so on. Uh, the complexities are not really trivial, but let's uh, hear about the open access, especially the open access situation in South Asia from our panelists. So. Uh, I will first like to invite our, uh, our first panelist, Ms. Anuba Sinha. She is a lawyer by training, currently works as a senior researcher at the Center for Internet and Society. As a researcher and public policy professional, she works at the intersection of the information technology law and society. So, and then uh, I will go to our second panelist and introduce him. Uh, Anuba, uh, please, uh, please. Uh, Hi, sure. thank you, Dr. Maumeda. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you to CCS for having me. And um, my opening remarks are basically going to be about the open access trajectory um, that India has seen um, and we have all experienced. So when the open access movement came into being, um, the Indian approach to loop to open access was pretty lukewarm, even though India was perhaps one of the countries that needed affordable and better access the most. At the time, it was reported that scholars were disinterested in making papers open, and compared to the public discourse and activity in the West, there was at the time less attention given to the issue of journal access and prices. But at that point, Indian librarians had realized the unsustainability of journal prices, and that led to the formation of consortiums to bargain better and as well as distribute costs. Soon, we had government agencies such as ICMR, CSIR, and uh, Indian Council of Agricultural Research making the journals open access. The Indian National Science Academy's journals were also open access by then. Post 2010, the Department of Biotechnology, Department of Science and Technology, um, Depart the Indian Mathematical, the Indian Institute of Mathematical Sciences. These are a few. These are a few notable institutions that had adopted open access policies, which was still largely voluntary. Um, sometime thereafter, uh, there was a serious problem that came about. That was of predatory journals. Um, this problem was primarily feeding on the scholarly need to be published um, and profiting of this inclination um, and again riding on the open access wave. Um, so, you know, as a policy response in India, what we did was that we had institutions create white lists for preferred journals to publish in. Um, but that effort then later was heavily criticized for the reasons of the methodology used for creating lists and um, you know, they're therefore impinging on academic freedom. The unfortunate fact was that many Indians, both individuals and companies were in the business and continue to be in this business and posing a threat to the integrity of research, not only in India, but globally. Indian experts um, and especially Indian academics who have 
continuously written and weighed in on open access issues, such as Professor Lakotia. Um, you know, he suggested uh, stopping payments of all kinds of open access charges and modifying the present faulty assessment system that relied on numbers of publications. Um, so, you know, this, this is a problem that continues, but then parallelly at, at, in 2018, it was also announced that India would be joining the European effort of Plan S. But then we went back on the decision Plan S was basically about addressing the problem of hybrid open access journals, amongst other things. It basically required that all state funded research uh, be mandatorily published in Plan S compliant open access venues, um, which were you know, uh, bereft of the extracting nature of hybrid open access. But it still did not go far enough as it still permitted journals to charge any publishing fees to be commensurate with the publication services delivered and structure of such fees be made transparent. So following this episode, there were further deliberations between scientists, government science agencies, and publishers. And by this point, the idea of our approach had evolved to adopting green open access as national policy and discouraging gold open access. Embargo was considered to be okay. Um, you know, by that point, we were spending 1500 crores on accessing journal articles. So the idea was to instead optimizing this amount on, um, you know, uh, accessing journals through a one nation, one subscription policy, and also declaring predatory journals problem, a national shame and calling for further ideas to tackle it. So by 2020, the process to revise a national science technology and innovation policy was well underway. And this time, address issue was close to access. This was a major shift as the 2013 policy uh, had not even recognized affordability or availability of scientific literature as problem. Now the idea of one nation, one subscription has been carried over to the draft policy. Um, the scheme requires the government to negotiate and purchase a single unified subscription from a consortium of publishers. Um, and after which these books and papers will be made available to all government funded institutions as well as taxpayers. Um, in 2020, I had written about various details that needed ironing out in regard to this plan before something like this adopted. The concerns for me back at that point were about which journals would get included and which would get excluded and how uh, will we adopt a methodology to do this. Um, and we'll also still end up paying uh, article processing charges to publish in the journals that may be covered by the scheme. The other thing to be noted here is that only two countries in the world, Egypt and Uruguay, have actually implemented something like this. Uh, Anuva, may I just intervene? So can you please make it a bit quick? Uh, so we yes, get more time yes. to discuss with the audience. Thank you. Just 30 seconds. So I, I think that we need to deliberate further as to what a nationwide subscription would mean for the country and the world's OA movement. And on the domestic fr policy front, I'm afraid that's where we are. And uh, thank you for listening to me. Sorry about uh, crossing the time limit, Mamu. No, no, that's okay. It was really an interesting, uh, all the aspects you brought is really interesting. So we would deliberate on all this letter in the discourse. So uh, our second panelist is Dr. Hasi Irfanullah. He's an independent consultant in environment, climate change, and research system based in Bangladesh. He's a shape of the scholarly kitchen, the blog of society for scholarly publishing. Uh, Dr. Irfanullah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really great to be uh, on this panel. And thank you for uh, CCS for organizing this fantastic uh, panel. I would like to focus on uh, uh, not only the barrier we face in the global south, if I may use this term, because I know there are some uh, debate on using that term, uh, essentially mean the low and low income countries. Uh, before going to the barrier or the how it is different from high-income countries, let us focus on the research system as a whole. Why we are talking about open access? When we see the research system, uh, 
Uh, of course, uh, there are four components essentially. One is the accessing research where open access actually comes in. Then based upon those past research we, which we access, we build or we design our research. Then comes the second component, conducting research. And But uh, con after conducting research, we need to communicate the research. That's the third component of research system, which essentially contribute to accessing research once again and building the uh, global knowledge. And finally, the fourth component is using research. But when we talk about about uh, access to research or open science, open access. In fact, we talk about all accessing research, conducting research, communicating research, and finally uh, using the published research or publicly available research. Uh, when we talk about uh, what is happening in terms of all these four uh, components of research system, yes, definitely, as uh, in, in her initial remark, Dr. Momika mentioned that. Accessing research can be. By accessing research, we mean the global research. That can be quite challenging because almost all, not uh, all, but almost all research are still behind the paywall. You need to subscribe them. Uh, so there are so many different options actually uh, out there, which we don't want to talk about, like I have and other issues. But we need to understand that when we talk about the Global South or uh, LMICs, there are numerous journals, regional journals, national journals, uh, or even international journals published from those regions, which are freely accessible. So when we talk about uh, open access, I often uh, ask the question, since we are talking about open access, who closed it at the beginning? Because it's supposed to be open anyway, it's supposed to be free. Of course, now the word open and free are quite different. Uh, let us not get into that debate uh, now. But there are certain interventions happening targeting the Global South. You may be aware of quite a few. It, it started, for example, uh, at the turn of this century. In fact, they will be celebrating their 20 years. I'm talking about Research for Life. It has brought together thousands of institutions from all around the world, and they categorize them into class A or group A and group B. So if you belong to group uh, one group, uh, and you are least in the country, your GDP is uh, is less than $200 billion or so, uh, you, you can get access to hundreds of thousands of uh, articles for free. But if you are a middle income country, you have to pay a certain amount. For example, like Ukraine, they are supposed to pay a certain amount, but Research for Life, they changed it, they made it free for, for 2022 for Ukraine scientists. So there are certain interventions uh, we need, we can actually uh, um, enjoy. Now, if I talk about conducting research, uh, uh, of course, when you conduct research, that depends upon whether you can access research or not. Uh, but when I talk about the third component, communicating research, yes. If you want to publish, if you want to make your research publicly available in a very good reputed journal, sometimes you have to pay. $10,000 for a particular article. Can you imagine $10,000? I was just having a quick calculation that if your article is 5,000 words long, you are paying $2 for one word. It means, you know, $2 means, uh, you know, extreme poor, uh, they earn per capita $2, less than $2 per day. You can do the math. How, how, uh, uh, unequal or inequity can be seen in that kind of uh, arrangement. Saying that, there are publishers who offer 100% waiver or discount for the authors who, who, try, who wants to publish uh, their article in open access. So you don't need to pay anything. $10,000 can be totally waived, depending on which category of uh, country you belong to. So, there are many things happening. There are lots of debates, there are lots of anomalies, but there are certain positive um, advancements happening. The last point I would like to talk about for now, that how um, high income countries approach to open access differs from uh, low middle income country. We must admit that uh, scholarly publishing, which uh, practically originated, uh, you know, 355 years back uh, in 1665, to be specific. And uh, West or now the global north, they definitely they are leading by scholarly publishing, the whole concept. 
they are talking about rules and regulation. They are talking about movement like planners, as Anubha mentioned. Even when we talk about different models, they are actually testing it. They are actually proposing it. Transformative agreement, uh, uh, hybrid uh, open access, as Anubha mentioned, that you can publish open access or subscribe, subscribe access, diamond access. So there are so many different terminologies uh, out there. But when we talk about what we are trying to do here, when we are trying to open it, I believe most of our journals, if not all, has always been freely accessible because the journal publishing cost traditionally is quite low. Uh, and now they term it in the West that this is platinum or diamond open access. But we have been practicing it. We never thought of it that uh, whether it is free access uh, or not accessible. Because in this part of the world, uh, our uh, uh, senior professors for decades, they just did it, editorial thing, uh, the, the running the editorial office for free. I mean, they never thought of how much money they are earning or not earning. That's why, how we lost it. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that, I'm not questioning who to blame, but why we have lost it, that, that kind of philosophy. Uh, because okay, so uh, again, I went uh, just intervening. Yeah. So sure. maybe yeah, these are the issues I wanted to say. Yeah, okay. sorry for intervention uh, because we have time constraints. So I would now go to uh, Professor uh, Devika. So she's a professor at Documentation Research Training Center, Indian Statistical Institute, Bangalore. She's also the chair of Working Group of OpenX India. So Professor Devika, it's here. Yeah. Uh, good evening. Um, Thank you for having me here this evening and also on a topic that's very close to my heart. I hope I'm audible. Yeah, the panelists before me, uh, I'm grateful to them. They covered the, all the salient points, like of course the concept of OA itself uh, and um, something like how uh, people or even the, the scholarly community, the academic community try to uh, grapple with the cost factor of publications by going into consortium agreements. Um, and in India also, we had various kinds of consortia, consortia for uh, technical, for university level, at the country level we have. And today, uh, India is also uh, speaking about one country, one subscription. So these are still, uh, what I want to say is, uh, these are cost containing uh, efforts, I can say but these are not open access efforts, okay? These two are different and we have to understand it as such. Um, th this is one point I, I would try to uh, make. The other point of course is uh, about uh, uh, um, open access, the paid route or, or I call it, um, excuse me for using this, keeping the publisher happy route, okay? <laughs> that is, uh, yeah, I'm known to speak like this, sorry. Uh, so, uh, plan is keeps the publisher happy, right? And India can't afford to keep the publisher happy. The Indian academic community, many of our um, smaller universities, the colleges, which have bright students who are not necessarily from affluent uh, urban class, and uh, still need to access scholarly communication, scholarly content for their own studies, for their own research, and uh, something like um, a capability uh, to be able to pay to plan this kind of a thing is really out of uh, the common, common uh, academic scenario in India. So that is the reason I don't have, uh, I don't, um, uh, I am sure a lot of thinking went into the construction of plan is, and I congratulate them on that, but uh, I have my reservations how that would ever, ever work for a country like India. Uh, and that's the problem. And coming back to the age old, um, uh, age old um, uh, sort of um, accusation, if I can say that, or whatever puts us on the defensive for open access is that uh, very sweeping statement that all that is open access is not quality content, okay? So this is something we have to contend with. This is something we have to live with. If I say that, no, no, my institute has, has this uh, repository and my scientists uh, are going to deposit into that, their preprints or, or if, they, if they want to publish a paper there, they would publish it. 
is that publishing model even acceptable for 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 the people who sit uh, there making the decision who are the decision makers basically the top brass who 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 really are involved into the uh, career progression of scientists and of academicians would they accept that and what is in their way of accepting that is the notion of quality i'm calling it the notion of quality right so who who ensures quality in paid content in in commercial journals it is the scholars it is not the publishers uh, employed people or something it is my friend a professor in in some country or the other working for some university or the other she or he makes the effort to read through make sure of the quality comment and then uh, comes the quality aspect and why can't the same quality be used in open access content it is the academicians who are um, contributing it is the the entire stakeholder you you just look at the entire stakeholder scenario in the cycle of stakeholders in this oa the publisher is the person who publishes uh, the 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 academician and the scholarly uh, scholar is the one who publishes the academician and the scholar is the one who peer reviews the academician and the scholar is the one who consumes it and again it's the academicians and the researcher and the scholar who is going to take it forward to the next level by using this research in this entire cycle where is the word publisher he is at best an outsider to this cycle facilitating the publication right she or he is that and i i respect them for that there's a lot of work that goes into that but not so much so that the entire content should be kept away from the academic uh, community so that's where i have problem and then the other problem i have is with the word impact and quality the impact and quality has been sort of so deeply ingrained into the brains of us academic community of the decision makers it's very very difficult for us to wash it away and remember the commercial publisher started way way ahead of open access publishers okay they have the advantage of the years of the decades they 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 started off with okay i congratulate yes they put all the effort all those years i, I cannot take that away from them and oe is just a toddler now we started what 25 years ago and very seriously about 15 years ago and really very seriously about 5 years ago i can say uh, considering these 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 uh, uh, open access journals must be on par so to this uh, end i i really uh, nowadays i i just end with this small uh, uh, sentence i i'm trying to work on building open metrics open content metrics ocm i call this is a, a term that i coined and i my my myself and my research team we are trying to work on this we have published the very first uh, uh, metric out of it called the open o factor open factor in the last issi uh, conference i'll be very happy to interact and answer questions further thanks very much yeah thanks a lot professor uh, devika actually you are the the all our panelists are really going in the same direction because just before you uh, dr irfanullah also said very similar that we had this culture uh, in the academic community how we lost it maybe we can go further on to discuss it uh, but uh, i would just now uh, want to understand from anuva Uh, about certain legal issues uh, because for example if we see that uh, as we don't want to pay or like we want to have it it's an open access without paying again extra to this publishers so the green open access where uh, researchers can put one of their copy of their uh, uh, article into an open repository uh, but then there is a the problem of embargo so Uh, under the indian copyright law uh, how authors right are preserved there so for example a article can have an embargo of 2 years or 1 year but if we want to put it immediately are we at a disadvantage situation as a uh, researcher or author so anuva if you can uh, clarify it a bit on that the legal matters it would be very interesting for us hey, thank you for that very relevant question um so just to sort of um talk about the law first so authors rights once copyright trans is transferred uh become fairly limited but at the same time typically rights are transferred in the final publication and not the preprint or any prior versions 
you know the underlying data the preprint versions they can be distributed and published by the author unless there is an embargo limitation so unfortunately yes the contract that author sign eventually with publishers plays a key role um and nowadays um with the proliferation with reasonable proliferation of open access policies you also see the institutional policies um uh, playing a role um you know that author may be subject to um sometimes we see that despite an institutional open access policy in place authors end up agreeing to terms that do not align with open access this is the reality and uh, i think that it is also important to recognize this practice and set a few sort of measures um as a course correction and that is something i get to see uh, in institutional policies or um uh, you know in sort of discussions around open access uh, as to how it's playing out in the reality in the institutions um secondly uh, let's assume that there are a few authors uh, who do manage to retain the copyright in their works um you know and uh, now in the spirit of open access they are interested in openly licensing their works um you know this would mean something like a creative commons zero license unfortunately on this point um indian law does not make it easy for an author to sort of relinquish their copyright or you know basically uh, adopt a cc zero license uh, in our law there happens to be a rather formal procedure that an author may have to follow to relinquish copyright um which involves publishing a public notice in respect of their works and given the legalistic approach it might not be easy for the average person to undertake such a process so the intention behind this rule in the law is um uh, but, but although the intention is clear um and 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 you know the most recent amendment to the law um in the process of making that amendment it had been recognized that you know relinquishing copyright and giving that power to authors is important um but unfortunately how it played out in practice um, has not been in the most author friendly way and uh, this is something that in fact uh, dr arul skeria from national university delhi has written on spicy ip and i encourage everyone to go and read it okay. yeah thanks thanks anuva actually it's as an author or researcher definitely i mean uh, we always don't understand legally where we, we stand but definitely what you explain right now uh, gives us some hope that maybe uh, there are ways that we at least we can make preprint or the or not the final version the other version available for for others to read i will now go to uh, dr haseeb um you talked about this that uh, there is a difference between lmics and and high, high income countries uh, in the approach uh, the way we approach to have open access uh, what will be your suggestions for this global south or lmics if i may say so that how together we can come and solve this problem because uh, we don't have so much of resources to pay let's say usd 10000 and uh, there are initiative like research for life as you have mentioned but then uh, not it's not always very uh, user uh, friendly for all the countries for example as an indian researcher or author i am not eligible for this apc waiver uh i mean this kind of problem definitely will be there for many other countries as well so how we can tackle this problem as a whole global south if you can throw some light onto that thank you very much uh, uh one thing i have been arguing for is we need to contextualize the kind of uh western or northern concepts Uh, i have i'm really quite uh, feeling quite encouraged uh, listening to dr uh, devika that she is challenging those notions the persona the way we define the way we define quality who who has given the authority to define a quality isn't it open access is always bad uh, free access is bad who, who can say that so uh, sometimes i feel uh, since i have been involved with a, a few uh, organizations uh, from the north it seems like to me that 
they are saying they are, they are trying to define things for us. So the first thing would be we need to define uh, what we want to define. Uh, if we believe in our legacy, our past history of creating knowledge, now we are talking about publishing it, making it open access. We need to define it for us. That's the first thing. So we need to contextualize. And that, that means that our why we want to publish? Is it just to get promotion? So there is, I can see one question that, what do we need to really, we need to publish in well-reputed journals? Who, who, who told us that, you know? So the first thing is individual countries as well as their institutions, we need to understand what do we mean by open access, open science, those movements. I understand we are not isolated. We are, we are part of the global, but who is leading it? Uh, my one argument is if we don't want, if we can't match all those diverse notions, we will be seeing isolations. Countries like Bangladesh, researcher will be reading the global research, but publishing in local journal because they will be just getting promotion out of it. But do we really want to see that kind of isolation, silos within the South even? So uh, my first argument would be contextualization at the country level. Then that this kind of interaction, you know, thank you very much once again uh, to CCS for bringing, bringing together different uh, aspects and perspectives. And that kind of discussion is very important. My final point would be, when we talk about openness, uh, there are issue of trust. So that kind of discussion is much more needed so that we can understand how, whom we are collaborating with and why. I should stop now, thank you. Okay, yeah, it's actually answers a lot of questions that we have probably and also gives us a direction because uh, let's say, the countries in South Asia, at least we can come together to build our context because we feel definitely our, our problems, our research needs are very similar. So why should not we come together, build a discussion like the Latin American has done? What is stopping us? So again, thanks for CCS to uh, bring this context. Maybe we can in future take this kind of discussion much more forward. But now I will uh, like to go to uh, Professor Devika because um, again, this government of India has now, uh, Anuba also had mentioned about this one nation, one subscription and all these things, which again, putting back the money again to the uh, coffer of the commercial publishers. Uh, then why should we do this? And what is the way out of it? I mean, I can understand that you already have mentioned, maybe we need to, uh, change our uh, evaluation system or how we we'll evaluate a research on should not be on where it is published or what is the quality based on this impact factor or so. So as a whole, how you want uh, our open access journey to move forward, Indian or the South Asian? Uh, so yeah. there we go. Thank you for the question. And I, I think it's it's most important to focus on this, especially in such a meeting where we are talking about policies. So uh, just to bring a perspective uh, from ISI, where I work, Indian Statistical Institute, uh, for about 15 years, we were driving um, workshops, practical workshops to build, build repositories so that we empower researchers and small institutions and even universities to simply be empowered to bring up their own repository, uh, to have their own workflow to, to publish papers, right? So whenever we held uh, such workshops, some 20 librarians or 25 faculty attended all over India, all uh, across the Asia actually. And even we held one workshop in uh, Tunisia for Libyan librarians. So wherever there was a call for us to help for repository building, we held a workshop. But to my chagrin, I saw repositories came up like that because we trained them on the on the uh, technology. We, we even gave uh, uh, live CDs and uh, facilitated the uh, bringing up the repository. That was fine. Even after months and years, they were not being populated. This is where came the question. Uh, we have overemphasized on technology, maybe. And it should really be uh, at that time uh, we were doing the bottom up, like we were going to the librarian, going to the researcher, going to the faculty and saying, open access is good. Why don't you think of publishing in, in a repository? And this is the way to do it. And this is how we were trying to convince. 
and then uh, when we realized that uh, it's not uh, happening I, that's when we started thinking it should really be a top down approach along with of course uh, hand in hand with the bottom up approach so the top down needs the to answer the question uh, we really need to focus uh, uh, on as a nation um, the on the benefits of oe for example um, right now in the pandemic uh, situation uh, uh, nobody can overemphasize the fact that if it was open knowledge, uh, the 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 spread of the pandemic, the uh, the ways to contain it, or what to expect, uh, all these learnings which came from, uh, I mean, quickly from the uh, much more affluent countries, if that was evenly distributed, maybe we could have prevented a lot of deaths. Um, and if the vaccines didn't take the, the sweet time they took. Uh, by shared knowledge, maybe we could have even uh, saved a few lives. So right now, there's a very good example in front of us what open knowledge can do and how we can leverage upon it in today's interconnected world. India is not isolated and cannot afford to be isolated in the OA dialogue. This is what we need to understand, that we cannot talk about one country, one, one subscription. That's okay. That's a cost-containing effort, and that's required. I'm not disputing that but OA is one step beyond that it's about celebrating science as a common commodity of to, to which reaches everybody uh, in time without any economic barriers without any economic barrier it's just like we talk about education uh, reaching everybody is so ideal why not these resources that 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 uh, that really fosters education science and knowledge Okay, so that's where I would like to bring the focus that as a nation, as a policy, we need an open access national policy. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Devika. It was it is really um, inspiring to see the kind of work that has been done at ISA Bangalore in your group, and uh, also the Open Access India. Uh, but I see that probably uh, maybe as a community, we can uh, even build the awareness and just that within in India, I would really argue that this should be done at least in the uh, South Asian context, because again, we had so much of similar uh, situations, be it in healthcare or education or everything. So maybe we should trust, try to... Uh, I try to communicate the benefit of open access to the researchers across this region. Uh, I think now I should move to the public question answer because we just have another 15 minutes. So I would uh, invite a question and answer from our audience if there are any. So um, I think there are some questions. Let's see. And I would request other also to uh, type in the chat box. So, okay, so uh, I think there was this question that uh, how much important it is to publish your research paper in well-reputed journal? So, um, yeah, uh, Professor Irfanullah already was uh, talking about this, that who defines that reputation, but then that's how we get promoted. That's how things move. So I would request uh, Professor Irfanullah to put a little bit light, throw light onto this, because at this point, as a researcher's um, this well reputation or impact factor is what is defining the promotion or career progression. So what what will you suggest that how do how to go about it? Because how to change even? So, uh, Professor Irfanullah, if you can throw some light into this. Am I audible? Yes, Dr. Mavita, you're audible. Um, I think okay. uh, Professor Pavla just got dropped off the call. Okay, so networks. maybe then this question I would like to then uh, pose it both to uh, Professor Devika and Anuva as well. Uh, so, Professor Devika, because this would be an interesting point to understand in our current research evaluation system, um, journal impact factor and number matter so much, how we can change this, how to go about this? Yeah, um, can I come in? Yeah. Yeah, please. So we have uh, a list, no? 
uh, which is held in front of our eyes. It is called care list by, by the UGC. So I have a problem with this, with that because that somehow is giving some journals some kind of ranking and some journals not so. And the policy is not quite clear which journal makes the cut and which journal doesn't make it. And luckily nowadays it is much better. Some open access journals and these have been included, but I would like to see a policy level. Since this discussion is about policy, if we really are going to say something is a, I, I have problem with many words, no? Another problem I have is with the word ranked in the, in the, in the term ranked journals. Now who ranks them and who gives them the award, uh, the podium finish and all, I do not know, okay? So, and also uh, uh, that's exactly why I say open access, open content must have its own metrics. Okay, I had a problem with these metrics of the impact factor of uh, commercially uh, published content. But now because we have lived with this and we have accepted those as the metrics that really in, uh, work as indicators to quality of content, world has accepted it. We open access content persons now have to bring up some metrics for open content and prove that here are some metrics you can use this and you can see for yourself that this material is also of quality okay so unless we we really work on a set of metrics for open content we can't really beat the notion of that rank in rank journals so that is, uh, that's what I wanted to emphasize. Okay, yeah, that's actually very interesting because this kind of metrics, if it has been into mainstream and our uh, funding agency uses them, then it will really be helpful for researchers. They wouldn't have to hang on to this uh, commercial publishers notion of impact factor. But this is what exactly Anuba was mentioning because of the predatory journal came into being uh, also because of uh, this paid open access and also it created so much and. Uh, problem into our system. So if Anuba, if you can throw a little more light onto this, it would be very nice. Sure, thank you. So um, the predatory journals uh, problem, like I had mentioned, um, but unfortunately it came into light that uh, there were Indian individuals and companies who had gotten into a uh, particular kind of a business where they were profiting off um, scholars who were interested in getting research published. And it so happens to be the culture in many countries, uh, including India, that uh, you know it's about the numbers, it's about how many articles you published. Um, and it's much less about the quality of the article that you're publishing. And as a solution to that, uh, publishing a whitelist of uh, journals that do not qualify as uh, predatory journals may have been a, perhaps one of the first, uh, may have been perhaps a valid first reaction have to sort of try to help authors as much as possible from falling into the trap. Uh, but of course, that's the only thing that we saw since, um, and, and then to that extent, you know, just, just relying on a list and, uh, you know, excluding other journals that may have come into the fore. Um, so, so, so this status of affairs is definitely not ideal. And there needs to be more thinking around uh, tackling this issue. And I totally agree with what Professor Devika just mentioned. Um, I really think that um, you know you need to create metrics uh, that work for us, that work for open access, and there needs to be a much much wider discussion around what these metrics should be. Um, and how would they work uh, in different disciplines, especially? Okay, yeah, thanks, thanks, Anuva. Actually, it's now giving us some direction that where we can go, where we will put the importance of open access, as well as we will have some alternative metrics to counter the commercial publishers. So now, my next question to uh, 
uh, Dr. Hasib is that what is the situation in Bangladesh? Because we are talking about India, uh, because like we know the Indian ecosystem better, but in Bangladesh, is it the same that uh, impact factor of journal or the number of publication, those are the, let's say, holy grail of uh, research uh, evaluation or so? Please. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, situation is the same because we, we are so much influenced by the numbers, isn't it? Uh, so when I see that on the social media, my friends, colleague at Quentis, they publish a paper. They don't talk about what they have published, but the impact factor of the journal they have published in. That shows that how much influenced we are. But things are a bit different because in Bangladesh, uh, we don't produce uh, not that much uh, uh, research publication in terms uh, of you know, the, the quantity. Uh, because we are lagging behind in South Asia as well. Uh, however, saying that, there are certain champions, certain uh, individuals who are trying to uh, take things forward. But those who are the decision makers, we are still uh, struggling to uh, update, or uh, there was an attempt in 2017 to unify um, uh, university recruitment and promotion rules where they tried to identify what kind of journal articles you are supposed to publish in different disciplines. That was fantastic. But unfortunately, over the last five years or so, things didn't happen because there were some resistance, uh, which was all over the media back then. Uh, but saying that, there are some uh, discussion going on that people are trying to showcase, for example, how in agricultural sector, when wheat blast came in the disease, um, in, 19, in 2016, and how a few weeks of open science data sharing actually could resolve the problem. Because in Bangladesh, we invest so much uh, money and uh, effort uh, in agricultural research. So in Bangladesh, uh, we see a certain movement, a certain discussion, but still the, the number, impact factor, age index, that is actually influencing us. I would like to look quickly talk about one thing, which is also creating a new direction, if I may. Uh, you may be, uh, uh, you, are, uh, you are all aware of the impact uh, ranking, sorry, uh, the ranking of the universities as well. You know, the global ranking we can't afford because we can't publish thousand paper per year. It is impossible for an institution. So there is a new ranking started in 2019, which is impact ranking of PHE the higher education. So they focus on SDG. So they will be picking up your article from the scopus and including them, whether you are contributing to SDG or not. So you see the way they are trying to rank us, researcher will now uh, rally to include SDG keywords in their paper. So who actually guide us, who actually influences us? Uh, amazing, isn't it? We are influenced by so many. Thank you. Uh, this is really interesting. I mean, of course, nowadays we, even in India, also we see certain directions given that we should work towards national priority or towards the SDGs, and maybe here also we will see only the keywords, um, and we have to definitely. Uh, make ourselves aware that we should not fall into that trap. So here actually Professor Devika's work would really be mattering so that we can have much more unified or matrices and also context specific matrices, maybe uh, metrics, what is one subject to subject also may it vary. So definitely, I mean, that discussion, probably we would need to have even broader discussion. Uh, but then uh, uh, there are some other questions in the chat box, I will take it up. So this is uh, another question that uh, Abhishek Vijay Gopal is asking about that, uh, about the steep charges, APC charges from the open access journal and uh, about the creative common license and sometimes copyright to the authors. So, uh, so, so uh, they want uh, the view from the panelists about this uh, APC charges and the creative common license and copyright to the authors. So maybe this is a question for Anuva. She would be able to tell us a little more about this copyright and common license, creative common license. How should we view this? Because we see that, uh, for example, in the open access publishing, uh, usually it's uh, creative common license more liberal, whereas in 
uh, closed access, it is more restricted. So how do you explain uh, this answer or this question? Thank you, thank you. No, a definitely very relevant question. Um, and I find that I find that this practice very problematic. And I think this practice fits into the concept of what we call pay to publish. Um, and, you know, uh, this is the classic sort of problem that, uh, uh, that, that, that people talk about into what open access evolved uh, into from what we were facing earlier, which was pay to read trying to access uh, paywalled journal articles to now authors facing this um, issue or you know having to uh, pay exorbitant amounts of money to publish their articles and then in the end that gets licensed as uh, you know something that's open openly available um, so yes uh, it is problematic it it should go away this is something that we need to solve for um, and goal open access is not a problem that uh, uh, India and Indians can afford to have. I think Dr. Devika, in her opening remarks, weighed in extensively on you know how uh, a lot of solutions that have come up recently have not been about open access or been pure open access. They've been mostly about finding a convoluted way to. Um, somehow comply with the spirit of open access, but they continue to fill the office of publishers. And I see this, this as you know, something uh, of that sort only. Okay, I think we are really coming to an end. So I would uh, actually start with Professor Devika to summarize the way forward, because obviously she has given us very nice uh, directions that how uh, not only just as a country in India, we can actually come together, maybe the even the whole South Asia and take this vision forward where open access would really mean open access. That means it is open and it's free and a community driven um, model can take it forward. So I would uh, request Professor Devika to uh, summarize so that we can have a way forward for our region and take uh, this vision forward. Professor Devika? Yeah, uh, in my opinion, the uh, way forward, I, I really, uh, having uh, said whatever I said so far, I still congratulate the open access community uh, of the world and of, uh, of South, uh, South and Southeast Asia. In particular, uh, there are worthwhile initiatives uh, to mention in Southeast Asia, uh, though only uh, e, uh, you people must have already read the report of the core, the core report for Open Access Asia report, the, the, the Confeder Confederation of Open Access Repositories, which is worldwide, is working as OA Asia for the Asian part. And they have brought out the latest report, and that report is based on the survey that they conducted in these countries. So uh, according to the survey findings, there's uh, already a lot of awareness of open access. There are already a lot of initiatives uh, ongoing in the countries here, but the only problem is they're not coordinated. This is one of the key findings of that report. They're not coordinated. The cooperation is uh, not visible between uh, these open access. So that is, I think the way forward is to forge cooperations uh, to, to make the best to leverage upon whatever we already have, at least to take stock of where we are uh, as uh, collectively, I mean collectively, all the South, uh, South uh, countries, uh, and then uh, only think of uh, how we could uh, address the other things that we don't have, but the pity is we still did not um, take stock of what we have. So this is one thing that I would think uh, is the way forward. The other way I have already repeatedly said it, that as a community, we must work and establish the quality of open content. So that, that question about quality uh, on open content should go. And that will take time. I'm not uh, under any illusion that it will go away tomorrow. It will take time, but we have to take the first baby steps towards it with, with the right intention. Uh, and I'm sure we can we can beat, beat them at their own game. I mean, they did impact factor, so I have published on O factor. Uh, they they did citation citation index, so I am doing O index, uh, open index. Maybe it's not the perfect one that I have published, 
I, I hope it is not because I want more and more uh, people to read that and say this is not the way to uh, uh, work out metrics for open content. There are other ways. Yes, I want this dialogue. I want this discussion to start. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Actually, it's very interesting work and definitely we should go back to you with more questions, maybe an email. Uh, now I uh, would ask Professor Hasib to uh, summarize on the way forward as a uh, community or as a South Asian community, how we can take this vision of open access forward so that we can come together and build something. Um, over to you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, take a step forward what Dr. Devika just mentioned. Uh, uh, understanding is definitely important, uh, surveys and the, the uh, stop taking of how we interpret open access but it shouldn't be the discussion among the academician, the researcher. Uh, if we want to create a new system on, by contextualizing open access for us, we also need to bring in the policymaker, the funder who are actually funding our research. Because you know, you unless you do research, you can't communicate it. Unless you uh, create new knowledge, you can't actually make it open. Uh, that's why we need to appreciate the fact that many of our countries, especially in South Asia, we are uh, countries in transition. So as we are changing economically, becoming uh, uh, middle income, lower middle income, upper middle income, we need to change the mindset of our policymakers, our politicians even. Sometimes I feel like uh, we need more researchers and scientists in our, uh, you know, in the, uh, as politicians to make real change because we can't actually convince the politicians to understand science. So uh, in joke apart, we need to do that. And the second point I would like to quickly mention, what the publishers, the big publishers are not doing, they are only stopping how many citations they are getting. So can't we, in this context, in South Asia, can't we create a notion that let us not talk about the number only, what real change our open access or open science can make in South Asia on the ground. The research impact I'm talking about, not the citation or impact of my paper. Uh, that's that's new, new, new discussion we can have. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Hasib. Actually, now we are merging because uh, Professor Devika is talking about open context. Uh, that the another index that you can bring that how it's even uh, actually impacting the society. So if we can even measure, maybe not in one or two numbers, but maybe there can be some metrics to measure it, that would even be more better, I feel. So now I would go to Anuban, since she is lawyer and she understands all the copyright and law, again, my submission to her is more towards legal point of view is that as a researcher, how do you think that uh, the research community should go about it to safeguard themselves so that they don't fall into uh, any legal problem with publishers because anyway, still we have to publish. We have not transitioned to anything. And uh, how even maybe as in go, uh, the South Asia, all researchers can go about it to legally safeguard them, but make things open access, even if they publish in some closed access journal or so. Over to Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Mahmita. So um, I would definitely ask researchers to take a look at the institutional policies that a lot of Indian institutions have created in respect of open access. Typically, uh, you know, at the end of these policies, there are sort of um, agreements and there are contracts, um, you know, in terms of what they call authors addendum and, you know, all of those samples are provided that um, authors can use to ensure that they are in compliance uh, with the policy as well as um, also sort of, and, and in the end, excuse me. Sorry about that. So just to sort of make sure uh, that they are following the best practices that have been already created in India. Um, and that are working for a small section of, of authors. Uh, so that would be one thing. Uh, the second thing is that, um, uh, you know, it's not easy for the average person to understand law and copyright law is a complex piece of law. Uh, but nonetheless, um, as, as, 
uh, as copyright remains one of the most important legal barriers to open access, it, it is also, um, well, it cannot be incumbent on the authors to familiarize themselves on the, with the law, but there can be some sort of an awareness building and sort of education happening around what copyright law uh, means for authors in practice and uh, depending on the realities of the discipline and the institution and how it sort of typically affects them. Um, so I think that would be another step that can be taken in this regard. Wow. Thanks, Anuba. Actually, it seems, it seems that we can actually maybe organize a workshop for authors as well so that they are aware of their rights, what they can do, and also in the context of their own institutional uh, mandates. So maybe even such kind of workshop maybe can be done, not just for India, it should be done maybe at least for the South Asia. So we can have researchers from Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Pakistan, Bhutan or so, so that we mobilize the community and build a discussion and also make them aware of the legal position as well. But yeah, so we are already kind of five minutes ahead. We are supposed to finish at eight. So, but still I would just quickly summarize that what we, got today is that definitely open access is important and since the pandemic showed us that actually what uh, what kind of Im uh, impact it can make to the society that now should actually mobilize us to go towards the real open access and from today's discussion we saw that uh, many interesting uh, developments are happening, not just from India or South Asia, but throughout the globe, which includes our, this region's uh, problem also takes into context like that research for life as Professor Hasib mentioned. So maybe now our next step could be to build a community and work towards a real goal for open access. Uh, with that, I will uh, end today's discussion here and thank you everyone to be here and, and also I would really like to thank our panelists today, Dr. Devika, Anuva, and Dr. Haseen for such wonderful discussion and putting forward so interesting points for us to take forwards. Thank you everyone. Have a nice evening. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Dr. Mamida, thank you, dear panelists. Thank you audience for thank joining you, us Barbara, today. And thank you. Uh, kind of a civil society. Maybe you have more things to do in future, it looks like. Okay. Absolutely. We'll keep continuing our uh, policy dialogue series on various topics. So stay tuned. Follow us on our social media to see what's coming up next. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today.